April 4th, 1984. For some time, he sat gazing stupidly at the paper. The telescreen had changed over to strident military music. It was curious that he seemed not merely to have lost the power of expressing himself, but even to have forgotten what it was that he had originally intended to say. He was conscious of nothing except the blankness of the page in front of him, the itching of the skin above his ankle, the blaring of the music. We've all had that moment when our train of thought is interrupted by a noise, someone calling out our name, or by persistent music played too loudly for comfort. Now imagine these interruptions as a constant presence. Military music was still the issuing from the Ministry of Plenty ended on another trumpet but with the voice from the telescreen nagging at his ears, the woman on the telescreen had started a new song. Her voice seemed to stick in his like brain jagged splinters of glass. The world in George Orwell's 1984 is one where it's impossible to escape noise. Winston is surrounded by a constant stream of darling sounds. Telescreens in every room spew forth party propaganda and music, and the environments around him are characterized by their overwhelming loudness, always the eyes watching you and the voice enveloping you. The notion is that if you can't change a person's mind, you can still overwhelm it with information and noise so that thought is driven out. Music serves several functions for Ingsoc, the ruling party in Oceania in 1984. It accompanies broadcasts of stunning victories in war and acts as an almost permanent backdrop to the rolling reports and news from the telescreen. But it also acts as another way to indoctrinate their citizens by careful early conditioning, by games and cold water, by lectures, parades, songs, slogans and martial music. The natural feeling had been driven out of them. Repetition of music and song allows the words of the party to be planted as a seed in the mind, and then through repeated ritualistic acts, it can be nurtured. In part one, when the face of Big Brother appears on the telescreen at the end of the daily Two Minutes Hate, the group breaks out into a deep, slow, rhythmical chant of B, 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 over and over again, a heavy, murmurous sound in the background of which one seemed to hear the stamp of naked feet and the throbbing of tom-toms. It was a sort of hymn to the wisdom and majesty of Big Brother. The music and mind of the party becomes the music and mind of the people, and this is what scares Winston the most, giving over his mind. Winston is a member of the Outer Party in Oceania and works in the Ministry of Truth editing and rewriting historical documents to match the constantly shifting party line. He is, however, at heart, a dissident. He hates the party and Big Brother and everything they represent, and the journal he starts writing on the 4th of April is his first act of rebellion. He wants to find others who think the same way, but this is almost impossible in a world where every action and sound is monitored and recorded. Instead, he finds comfort in the words that he writes and the rare moments and places where he feels completely alone. One of those places is a room above Mr. Charrington's shop, one of the only rooms that Winston knows of that doesn't have a telescreen. And it's during his time in this room that his mind starts to wander and invent. After a discussion about old rhymes and churches with Charrington, Winston begins to imagine the peeling of bells in now dilapidated buildings. It was curious, but when he said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells the bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised and forgotten. The important distinction between this imagined sound, this music, compared to the music of the party, is that Winston's music is arrhythmic, and as far as possible from the stamping, repetitive rhythms and discordant noise that comes from the telescreens or the people. This idea of freedom of expression in music, and of singing in particular, becomes the embodiment of an idealistic future, one without the party or Big Brother. Part two in the novel brings Winston closer to this feeling of freedom as he begins his affair with Julia, meeting in secret in the countryside. What's notable about this section of the novel is the marked shift in Orwell's language. Winston picked his way up the lane through dappled light and shade, stepping out into pools of gold wherever the boughs parted. The air seemed to kiss one's skin. 
And with this new language and new love comes new music. A thrush had alighted on a bough not five metres away and then began to pour forth a torrent of song. In the afternoon hush, the volume of sound was startling. The music went on and on, minute after minute, with astonishing variations, never once repeating itself. It was as though it was a kind of liquid stuff that poured all over him and got mixed up with the sunlight that filtered through the leaves. He stopped thinking and merely felt. The key here is the lack of repetition, the ability of the bird to express without care, without thought and without oppression. The bird sang, the proles sang, the party did not sing. To sing was to be free. But freedom was never really an option for Winston. Julia and Winston try to maintain their affair, meeting as often as they can. But at the end of part two, they are arrested. We find that Winston had actually been watched and listened to all along. His diary had been read and the whitish dust on the cover carefully replaced. He had been recorded with Julia, watched whilst making love to her in the room above the shop, followed by eyes behind screens and marked as an enemy of the party. There was no physical act, no word spoken aloud that they had not noticed, no train of thought that they had not been able to infer. Winston's torture in the Ministry of Love and his final betrayal of Julia in Room 101 was really inevitable. And so was the shift back to the music of the party. Gone now is the fluid, free, unrepetitive music of part two, replaced again by the shrill, repetitive, beating music of Big Brother. The final chapter in the novel sees Winston return to the Chestnut Tree Cafe. The chestnut tree was almost empty. A ray of sunlight slanting through a window fell on dusty tabletops. This scene almost exactly mirrors a memory that Winston had recalled in part one, where he saw three defectors sitting in the corner of the same cafe in silence, waiting for death. Orwell even goes as far to give us exactly the same description of the sounds he heard. A tinny music was trickling from the telescreens. In both versions of the scene, the music suddenly shifts. The tune that they were playing changed, and the tone of the music changed too. It was a peculiar, cracked, braying, jeering note. In his mind, Winston called it a yellow note. And then a voice from the telescreen was singing under the spreading, spreading chestnut, chestnut tree. tree. I implore you once I again told you, to shoot me you while my mind me. is clean. Winston's fate was sealed from the beginning, hidden in the music and songs of Big Brother. They can't get inside you, she had said, but they could get inside you. What happens to you here is forever, Brian had said. That was a true word. There were things, your own acts, from which you could never recover. Something was killed in your breast, burnt out, cauterized out.